Hello everyone, my name is Matthew Shepard. I'm a second year PhD student based at the University of Bath's Milner Centre for Evolution in the UK. And my talk for the Fitch Symposium is on gene regulatory network evolution through the rewiring of transcription factors. So a key outstanding question for evolutionary biology is understanding how phenotypic novelty is generated. There's been a lot of focus on the generation of genotypic novelty, particularly through gene duplication. This is where a second copy of a gene is generated by a mutation, and then selection and fine tuning creates a new function for one of those copies to create a new gene. This builds collections of homologous genes within genomes, which share common ancestors as well as a common three-dimensional structure. However, as I'm sure you're aware, a phenotype is a lot more than just a collection of genes and novel genes within a genome. So we need to develop a better understanding of the evolution of the genotype to phenotype map for an organism. A key determinant of the genotype to phenotype map are the structures of gene regulatory networks. These are collections of transcription factors, cis regulatory elements, and other control systems that determine the timing and magnitude of gene expression within a cell. They are normally modular and contain a small number of master transcription factors that control a large number of target genes. These networks exist within all living cells and in general determine an organism's response to its environment or the generation of its phenotype. Because of this, they are key hotbeds for phenotypic evolution, as it is much easier to achieve a change to a phenotype in response to an environmental challenge by having mutations occur within the regulatory systems rather than all of the individual target genes, and this has been observed in a large number of experimental studies. So my PhD project focuses on the evolution of transcription factors within these networks. A key property of these regulators which is thought to facilitate their evolution is functional promiscuity, or crosstalk. This is where a transcription factor binds the promoter for a gene that it does not normally regulate. This is possible when the two transcription factors involved share a degree of structural homology, so are able to bind similar promoter sequences. This situation forms the raw material for evolution in changing the connections that a transcription factor has, and therefore the phenotypic outcome of a network that it is a component of. We can now come up with a theoretical model for how evolution can make use of this situation, either by allowing it to change the connections that a transcription factor has, or allow it to gain transcription factor connections within a network. Evolution can also use this situation in the development of new transcription factors. Imagine this transcription factor has been duplicated and can promiscuously bind this gene. Evolution can then diverge those two transcription factors to create a new transcription factor and add it to the network. So this is a nice model for how evolution might go about changing the connections within gene regulatory networks. However, there is a significant lack of experimental data to back up how this process would work in practice. In the Taylor Lab at the University of Bath, we have a lovely model system which can begin to provide some experimental data for this process. So we work with the common soil bacterium Pseudomonas fluorescens, particularly a Delta Flea Q knockout strain. This is the master regulator for the flagellum, and without this, the strain cannot swim in a soft motility agar plate. However, given long enough, 48 to 96 hours, the strain begins to swim again, and longer still, a faster swimming strain evolves from this. When we look at what is going on mutationally to facilitate rescue of the flagellum, we find that rewiring of a transcription factor is occurring. So this is the transcriptional network for flea Q, the master regulator of the flagellum. Remember in our strain, flea Q is knocked out. We find mutations in an unrelated pathway, the NTR network, which normally controls nitrogen assimilation. The first mutation we see is in the NTRB gene, which blocks binding of the GLUN-K negative repressor. This causes overactivation of the NTRB kinase, leading to hyperphosphorylation of NTRC, which allows it to start promiscuously binding the promoters that are normally controlled by flea Q, rescuing the flagellum. This does carry a fitness cost, however, as nitrogen assimilation is overexpressed, which is damaging. The second step mutation we see refines this, and it occurs in the DNA binding domain of NTRC. It switches the protein's binding specificity to focus on strongly expressing the flagella genes. This also mitigates the fitness cost associated with nitrogen assimilation overexpression by reducing the expression of these components. 
So this original study provided a good bit of experimental data to back up the theoretical model we had. My PhD set out to use this as a model system of understanding the factors that matter for evolutionary rewiring of a transcription factor. I began with an exploratory question. We always see the NTR pathway being rewired to rescue motility, never any of the other 21 flea Q homologous transcription factors present in Pseudomonas. This is a 3D structural homology tree of flea Q homologs, and we see that NTRC and flea Q are not the most closely structurally related to one another. In fact, these other regulators are more close structurally to flea Q. So why does not evolution never use any of these other regulators? So I'm asking, can any other regulators be rewired, and what determines the evolutionary access or viability of one pathway over another? I'm also wondering, if there are multiple pathways, can I ascertain any general principles or rules that govern their evolution? The method I used is a double knockout mutant of flea Q and NTRC, so this forces evolution to take one of the alternative rewiring pathways if it plans to rescue motility in this manner. What I find is that this double knockout strain can still rewire a regulator to rescue its motility. So here we have the immotile ancestor, and then we get a first step motile strain followed by a faster swimming second step motile strain. And when we take a look at these cells under the microscope, we see that the immotile ancestor cannot swim. And then in the case of the first step and second step motile strains, cells are doing classic tumbles and runs. So this is highly indicative of flagella mediated motility. So this does suggest that a regulator has been rewired to rescue flagella gene expression. However, we immediately get some explanation as to why the NTR pathway is used preferentially. This is a violin plot, which is like a box plot, except shows the distribution of the data laterally, and is a plot of time to emergence of the phenotype in days on the y-axis. This shows that the first and second step of the NTR pathway occur within two to four days, whereas the first step of the alternative pathway takes on average two weeks to evolve. Once you have the first step, the second step evolves rapidly. Interestingly, only 8% of the lines that I evolved, so independent replicates, gained motility after six weeks. This is compared to 100% of the replicates for the NTR pathway. So it seems like the alternative pathway is less visible to selection. This does seem to explain why we don't see the alternative pathway when the NTR pathway is available. When we look at the mutations that facilitate this alternative pathway, we see a similar story emerging. This is the FLEQ network with its master regulator deleted. We see mutations in a putative kinase, PFLU1131, which phosphorylates a putative regulator, PFLU1132. The mutations we see likely overactivate this kinase, leading to hyperphosphorylation and overactivation of the regulator. Because this regulator is also FLEQ homologous, this allows it to start promiscuously binding flagella promoters and rescue flagella gene expression. When we look at the mutations in detail, we see that all of them are within the PFLU1131 kinase gene. 73% of them are identical 15 base pair deletions. 86% of them all occur within the same 26 base pairs of the PFLU1131 gene. This suggests that these mutations are highly constrained evolutionarily and goes some way to explaining why the alternative pathway is not used preferentially to the NTR pathway. We also find that the alternative rewiring pathway may be rare due to low fitness. This is a graph of motility fitness where distance moved is measured in millimetres on the y-axis and this is all measured relative to 1, this black line, which is the distance moved by the NTRB mutant. We see for the PFLU1131 mutants, they move roughly a third the distance of the NTR pathway mutant. So this suggests that they may be rare simply because they're not so strong swimmers. We also took a quick look at the metabolic fitness. This is measured in shaking LB broth where motility provides no advantage. Again, this is measured relative to 1, which is the fitness of the NTRB mutant. Remember, this mutant pays a big metabolic fitness penalty due to overexpressing the nitrogen genes. Here we have the immotile ancestral strain, and we see that the 1131 mutants do not pay a significant pleiotropic fitness cost. When we look at the second step mutations for this alternative pathway, we find that they really highlight gaps in our understanding of the rewiring process. So there are mutations in a very large number of genes for this second step. However, they can be grouped into three broad categories. The first is one of global gene expression control. 26% of mutations occur in a sigma factor regulatory system, and some mutations also occur in RPOC. These are all components of the RNA polymerase complex. There's also mutations in a 30S ribosomal subunit. 
These will change global gene expression in quite a drastic way, affecting a large number of genes. I also see a set of mutations which target core carbon and nucleotide metabolism, particularly the pentose phosphate pathway, TCA cycle, and glycolysis. Again, this will change metabolism in a drastic way, as well as gene expression for a large number of genes. Finally, we see a set of genes which have mutations that make a little bit more sense. They are in PFLU1131, 2, and the promoter, so the transcriptional machinery that we see being rewired. Interestingly, none of these mutations are analogous to the second step mutations of the original NTRB and C pathway. Remember that the second step mutations were in NTRC, particularly its DNA binding domain. I don't see a single DNA binding domain mutation for the homologous PFLU1132 transcriptional regulator. So it seems like mutations are being used to change global gene expression in an attempt to facilitate the rewiring of a regulator. We would never have predicted this off of any previous models and even off of our previous experimental work. So this really highlights the importance of thorough empirical evidence in understanding evolutionary processes. There is one mutation that I haven't discussed yet, which gives the game away for what the second step mutations are doing. This is the state of the PFLU1131 and 2 network after the first step mutations. PFLU1132 is overactivated and is binding the flagella genes. I see a second step mutation which targets the locus of PFLU1131 and 2. They are normally next to one another and under the control of an unknown promoter. They are also next to a set of metabolic genes that are under the control of an ARPO-N promoter. This is notable as PFLU1132, NTRC and FLEQ are transcription factors that all bind ARPO-N promoters. I see a large deletion which conserves the reading frame but joins these two sets of genes together. This means that PFLU1132 is now under the control of the promoter that it can likely bind, either naturally or through functional promiscuity. So this creates a positive feedback loop, where PFLU1132 controls its own expression as well as the expression of PFLU1131. This will lead to very high expression levels of overactivated PFLU1132, which will likely bind flagella genes strongly and boost their expression to allow for stronger swimming. I think that the large-scale changes to global gene expression we saw in the other mutations are likely also attempting to achieve the same effect of boosting the level of expression for PFLU1132. However, they achieve this through other larger-scale broad changes. So the data and findings from this work lead me on to a set of interesting predictions that I can make about gene regulatory network evolution. So I think that this rewiring mutation, which allows for a positive feedback loop to occur, makes both networks, the PFLU1131 and 2, and the NTR network, more structurally similar to one another, as they now both contain positive feedback. And it seems that overactivation of a regulator, which is being highly expressed due to positive feedback, is an important characteristic for its potential to rewire. So this leads me on to think that gene regulatory network structure will be constraining the ability of a regulator to rewire as this controls the gene expression of that regulator. So to summarise the key findings and predictions of this work, multiple regulators of the same homologous family are capable of rewiring to rescue the function of a member as long as the selective conditions are right. I've also found that evolution can make use of changes to global gene regulation to facilitate the rewiring of a regulator, which is not something we would have predicted based off of previous models and experimental data. I can also predict that gene expression is an important factor for determining the availability of a regulator for evolutionary rewiring, and that because of this, evolutionary pathways for rewiring are going to be constrained by the regulatory network structure that a regulator finds itself in. This is similar to the concept of constraints in EvoDevo, where routes for evolution are being limited by pre-existing network structure. I could coin the term Evo Expresso constraints, where the speed and direction of gene regulatory network evolution is being constrained by pre-existing network structures and pre-existing gene expression. Thank you very much for listening. I'd like to thank the organisers of the SMBE 2020 online Fitch Symposium. I'd like to thank my supervisors, Tiffany Taylor and Lawrence Hurst, the members of the Taylor Lab, our collaborators, and the Raw Society for funding my research. I look forward to discussing my research with you and answering any questions you may have on Twitter.